thank you for joining us today. Um, I'm Lori Salganikoff, the Executive Director of the Chestnut Hill Conservancy. Uh, the Chestnut Hill Conservancy is committed to preserving the historical, architectural, and cultural resources, as well as the open spaces that define the character of Chestnut Hill and the surrounding communities within the Wissahickon watershed. Our Ask the Experts program is made possible through the generous support of our event sponsor, Hearth Builders, along with the supporting sponsor, Wallace Landscape Associates. Additionally, the continued support from our general and supportive businesses along with our members enables us to offer free or low cost programs such as this. The Ask the Experts lecture series is done in collaboration with our friends at the Chestnut Hill Community Association. Both the Community Association and the Conservancy are part of the Save the Train Coalition. Uh, in support of the Saint Save the Train campaign, the Conservancy is organizing a self-guided walk of the train stations of Chestnut Hill West as part of our Discovering Chestnut Hill lecture series. There will be docents and representatives from Save the Train at Chestnut Hill West, Highland, and St. Martin stations on Saturday, April 20th, with a rain date of April 27th from 1 to 3 p.m. This program is free, but all donations from registrations will be and, and contributions will be given to the Save the Train campaign. And to learn more about this, please visit our website at uh, chconservancy.org. Now, it gives me great pleasure to introduce the Conservancy's new event sponsor, Hearth Builders. Uh, we are honored to have Greg Hearth, the president of Hearth Builders, with us. And I was just reminded that Hearth Builders was a featured con a contractor with one of our Great Houses Tour programs a few years ago. So I'm delighted to introduce and welcome Greg. And uh, thank, thank you. Thank you for the introduction, Laurie. Uh, my name is Gregory Hearth. I'm representing Hearth Builders. We are a design builder modeler uh, located in Lower Gwinnett Spring House. Um, we work with clients who are frustrated with their current homes. Um, they've looked around at uh, uh, buying another house, and but uh, they love, after thinking about it, they love where they live, they love their neighbors, they love their commute, they love their community, they love their low taxes, whatever, and they decide to invest in their home. Um, I personally love older homes and we prefer to work on a 1950s or a 1920s or an 1860s house any day of the week over a 2010 track home. Um, so I, we have a lot of clients that are in the Chestnut Hill, Mount Airy, East Falls area. We've worked on some very notable homes, uh, including the McNeil house on East uh, Willow Grove Ave, which is, we just finished up. Uh, we were uh, more recently, we've worked with uh, the White Marsh Foundation off of Erdenheim Farm, and we won a national award for historic renovation on that, uh, that project with Edie Dixon. Uh, we're working on the Highlands right now in their gardener's cottage, and uh, we've done a number of projects for Morris Arboretum and other nonprofits. Um, as sponsors of Ask the Experts, we are thrilled to support the Conservancy's free program. It's our pleasure to contribute to this program and the community initiative where attendees like yourselves can ask questions and get solutions about featured topics by local experts on historic homes and landscape care. As president of Hearth Builders, I'm incredibly proud to contribute to the program that empowers homeowners with valuable insights and solutions. And tonight, we're gonna to explore nine innovative rainwater management systems offering practical solutions for reducing the stormwater runoff. Uh, thank you for joining us as we delve into these critical topics together. At this point in time, I'll introduce Anne of the Chestnut Hill Community Association. Thank you, Greg. Hello, everybody. My name is Anne McNiff, and I am the Executive Director at the Chestnut Hill Community Association. Welcome tonight. The Community Association is very proud to be a partner with the um, Conservancy on the Ask the Expert series. Uh, we uh, work in collaboration with them uh, to present these to our community and uh, have been doing so for a couple of years and are very pleased to be here tonight. For those of you who uh, are community association members, I'm sure you're very familiar with what we do. However, if you are not a community association member, uh, I'll just let you know that the community association, we are uh, just celebrating our 75th year here in Chestnut Hill. And uh, we, our mission is to uh, bring together 
uh, community members um, from all um, all over Chestnut Hill to in uh, help improve uh, quality of life and a establish a sense of community. And we do this through a, a lot of different activities. Uh, most of them are what we call community activities, which um, are free to the general community. And they include everything from Pastorius Park concert series during the summer, as well as movie nights during August. We have a holiday parade, a pet parade. We do a holiday house tour. And there's a wide variety of other activities. I invite you to check out our website, chestnuthill.org, uh, to see all of our activities coming up. I also encourage you to join if you're not currently a member. Your membership includes a year-long subscription to the Chestnut Hill Local, uh, which is, our, of course, our local newspaper. And uh, that is uh, currently the award-winning uh, number one small newspaper in the state of Pennsylvania. And we're very proud of the work that they do. So I'm going to turn this back over to Lori and she's going to do uh, some other introductions. Thank you. You're welcome, Anne. It's so great to have you. Um, I'd like to you know, uh, um, introduce Rob Fleming, who will introduce our speaker. Rob? Hi, everybody. Um, I'm delighted to do this. Uh, Hap and I uh, have known each other 50 years. We were graduate students together at the University of Pennsylvania. We were child prodigies. We learned how to walk and eat solid food while we were there, uh, which explains we're younger than you might think. Uh. Um, anyway, Hap's field, uh, Hap works in the field of home performance, where he's had extensive experience working with contractors and builders. He carries six Building Performance Institute certifications and was inducted into the BPI Hall of Fame in 2011. He has personally trained over 1,000 contractors for their BPI certificates. In the early 80s, HAP pioneered the home systems approach towards energy education for the energy house, the first of his three green metal homes, green model homes, excuse me. HAP incorporated and directed several uh, for-profit and non-profit corporations that focus on ener energy education and training. And he served on as a uh, Department of Energy technical field observer. HAP works for the firm of Clear Result, which is a company that um, helps uh, homeowners uh, manage uh, their households sustainably, uh, among other things, uh, at much larger scales than that. And he's a manager uh, of, and for that company, he's a manager for PP PPL. Electric Utilities, that's the old Pennsylvania Power and Light Company. Uh, PBL has residential pilot programs that he uh, helps with, and he's an award-winning gardener, and he posts weekly notes about sustainability uh, with the handle at home, excuse me, at Green Home Guru. So I'm very happy uh, to turn the uh, screen over to Hap. And I just want to tell you, um, I will be watching the chat as Hap is speaking, uh, collating any questions you have. So if you have something uh, that, that you'd like to ask that uh, in reaction to something you hear from Hap, please put it in the chat and I will um, read your question uh, at the end when Hap is finished and uh, Hap will give you the answers. So go ahead, Hap. <laughs> and Hap will try to give you the answer. Rob, thank you so much for that introduction. And I want to start out by saying thank you to the Conservancy for and all, all their sponsors uh, for having you know, this presentation tonight and the entire Ask the Experts uh, webinar series. I really appreciate that you're what you're doing uh, in the community. And with that said, I'd like to talk directly to the people who are visiting tonight on the web with us. Thank you for coming. I know it's uh, taking time out of your busy day and I really do appreciate you attending the webinar. And I hope that my passion for this subject you know, comes through and that you can find some portion of the presentation tonight to apply to your home as well. So with all that uh, you know, said, let's talk about the presentation, right? It's, there's a, a lot to be uh, gone over tonight. First of all, I'm gonna to talk about what is the Sunhaven Carriage House. 
then the what is the problem with rain? And that this is kind of an interesting conversation. Uh, what are the components of a rainwater system? I'm going to show you one failed project, so you can see how easy it is to actually screw up, you know, with these things, and how we changed it to becoming a real positive thing in the end result. I'm going to go over the nine current projects that we employ here at Sunhaven, and I also have a special guest that I brought along uh, to talk about his project tonight as well. And of course, at the end, we'll have Q and A. And as Rob said, please put your questions in the chat. He'll be monitoring the chat. And at the very end, we'll get to all those individual individual questions. So lots to do, let's get to it. All right, this is the Sunhaven Carriage House. And what I wanna do is I want to basically, you know, introduce you to the house before we get going into the, you know, into the presentation. While I shuffle things around. All righty. This is an somewhere between 1880 to 1890 <clears throat> stone carriage house. You can see how I found it in the right hand upper slide here. And so it was a gut rehab to become a solar and energy efficient model home. We've done so much with this house and we've uh, done uh, workshops that had to do with both active and passive solar, mass wall construction. You can see in that upper photograph on the right, we have 18 inch stone walls here. So great opportunity for mass uh, construction, which uh, stores heat. And you can see on the left-hand photograph, all the French doors that are now in front of that old entrance where the carriages were kept. We've done webinars and presentations on energy efficient appliances and sustainable home in a large sense. And as Rob was saying, uh, my weekly posts are on Green, uh, Green Home Guru. We've had workshops about material reusing, recycling, salvage, non-toxic materials into air quality. We're an award-winning garden. We're certified by Audubon and the National Wildlife Federation. And the, the latest one is the Penn State Master Garden uh, Gardeners Program. They have a sort of a subset that is to certify watership friendly properties. And let me just say that this is the third, and Rob mentioned it, this is the third of three uh, energy model homes that I've had open you know, to the public over the years. It's not open to the public now. And that's one of the reasons why I'm giving this presentation because I wanted to bring a lot of the work that we've done over the last 30 years, you know, to this uh, to this venue. All right. So the first question here is what's wrong with rainwater? Yeah, that's that's a, an interesting question, because what we tend to see is the problems like Hurricane Ida here. This is down in, uh, uh, along the, the, the Schuylkill River, the flooding they had in Maniunk back in 2021. OK. That's what the radar looked on at that day at the end of the storming. Okay, so there's flooding associated with rainwater, excess rainwater. There's loss of life every year, something in the neighborhood of 50. Some people die uh, in, uh, in flooding accidents. And of course, there's property destruction and loss of livelihood. If I were to ask the question again, what's wrong with the rainwater? Okay, well, you can see this is the, the experience we have on East River Drive or Kelly Drive on a regular basis where it's impassable, okay? But there's also pollution associated with rainwater. In Philadelphia, we have a lot of mixed storm and sanitary sewers. This is the outlet of a storm sewer down in Maniunk along the Maniunk Canal. And that gray water is not storm water, it's sewage coming out of that, that outfall that goes into the canal and then onto the, you know, the river. So there's disease. This is just a little further up the river, closer uh, to the edge of Philadelphia and Conshohocken. Uh, and this is polluted water coming out from a railroad yard. Uh, we also have erosion. And you see this anywhere you walk, I think, in the Philadelphia parks, you know, loss of topsoil you know, and erosion. So it would appear that there's a lot of things wrong with rainwater. But I'm going to like flip the script and say, What's wrong with rainwater? Absolutely nothing. Okay, what it is, is poor design. 
that doesn't take into consideration the implications of storm runoff. And this is a great picture, series of pictures here to show you just that. The picture, the large picture is Bell's Mills Bridge. And if anyone's on the line is familiar with that, usually the water is about two feet lower than this picture. This was the two inch rainstorm we had in January 9th. That exact same time, you go up one of the side creeks, the top picture on the right, and you see that it's swollen a little bit, but it's not flooding. And you go to the bottom right-hand picture, this is on the backside of Chestnut Hill, and it's just a little trickle. So the interesting here is the problem of flooding happens downstream, but the solution to stormwater runoff happens upstream in your yard. And that's what we're here to talk about tonight. What can we do in our yards? What have I done in my yard in order to, in order to <clears throat> excuse me, minimize the, uh, the issues with uh, storm runoff? All right, so if, if we were a hydrologist or an engineer, you know, or a landscape architect or something, I'd be looking at different considerations if I'm trying to create a plan for a house. Calculations include porosity of both the material and what's under the material, meaning like the grass and the soil, the slope of it, the amount of rain over time, and oddly enough, soil temperature, because you can imagine in the wintertime, if the ground's frozen, the rain runs right off. There's nothing that's going to soak into the soil. So if we're talking about porosity or average runoff, you have to look at the particular material, roof, paving, lawns, woodland. Each material has a different percentage of rain off. But most people that collect water, okay, for either to impound on site or for uses like in a rain barrel, are collecting it from an impervious service. And so let me talk about it. Here is the back of my house. And if you were to look at this collection area, this is just one of several collection areas. On the left, the upper roof and the lower roof in the middle, okay. Those things add up to about, oh, and let me just say, all that drains to the left. The shingles on the right show you what's draining to the right. That's a different catchment area. That's a different system altogether. So let me just say that the collection area for this, the left-hand blue section, is about 500 square feet. So if we want to do the math, which is really pretty straightforward, we take that 500 square feet, multiply it times a little number, and we get 41.7 cubic feet. Okay, for every inch, okay, of rain that comes that falls on that roof. And just for perspective here, between January one and now, we've had 10 rain events over one inch, one rain event over two inches, and one ra uh, rain event over three inches. So it's very easy to get an inch rain, at least at this time of year. And if you multiply that number times 7.48 gallons in a cubic foot, you get about, and this is roughly, you know, we're, we're ballparking stuff here, three over 300 gallons of water collected every time you have a rainstorm. Now that's important because if we're trying to understand, well, how much space do I need to collect something, then I need to know that number. Now I have for this collection area, two 250 gallon IBC totes. And we're gonna be talking about that uh, shortly. They're large containers for, uh, for storing in this case water. Okay, so with one one inch rain, I can fill two thirds of the storage there. So it's just sort of useful to uh, take in consideration. This is all big picture stuff here. I'm gonna get into the specific soon, but I wanted to set the stage for you. Okay, the pictures here are all something that you would call detention basins. Okay, if we're talking about what can we do upstream, it's really about runoff reduction. And there's two basic ways of doing it. And there's lots and lots of details, but there's two basic ways. One is retaining the water. The other is detaining the water. And if, you've, if you're like older than, I don't know, 30 or 40, you might know this from high school, and that is if you acted out during high school, you went to detention. The objective of detention was not to keep you overnight and forever. The idea was to hold on to you for a short period of time and then let you go. And so a detention basin is exactly that. It's meant to store a certain volume of water 
and then release it over time. And it's done in a couple different ways. Okay, the, one, the big picture here releases it into the soil. So it's groundwater recharged directly into the soil. The two pictures on the right-hand side, these are the same basin. This is full. This is when it was just being draw, uh, uh, built. And you can see on the far side here, there is a retaining dam, but the dam is made up of <clears throat> rock gabions. It's just a metal cage with large gravel in it. So the water can move through it, but very slowly. So it detains the water. Moving on, I want to tell you the four components in every you know, system, rainwater system, and these are the four, capture, control, storage, and usage. It doesn't make a difference what system you're using. You're going to use all four. Capturing is collecting the water. It's on a roof, a patio, side. It's even on tarps. I know a guy out in Arizona who's taken tarps from billboards, you know, the actual, you know, big billboard tarps, has put it down on the desert floor in a slight swale. And when the rain falls, instead of going into the ground, it hits the tarps and goes and then is collected. So that's capture. Control is the next step. What do I do with it? And the normal systems that we talk about are roof gutters, downspouts, ground gutters, yard drains, pipes, culverts, swales, these kinds of things. And then we're going to do something with that. Okay, we're going to store it. And we're either going to store it in something that is porous or non-porous. Obviously, the non-porous things, like tanks, is intended to be reused. The others is all about allowing the water to go back into the ground and recharge ground. And then, of course, that falls directly into use. How are you using the water? And the above ground, like the totes, the IBC totes I talked about, okay, that's all about the yard, the garden beds, vegetable gardens, bird baths, things like that. So those are the four key things, key elements of every rainwater system. All right, let's talk about the failed project. Remember I said I was going to start with a failed project? Here it is. This is a a fascinating thing. And I'm going to describe it as a termite spa. That sets up the story for you. Just imagine this. Okay, first of all, I had a collection area. That was the roof. And we all know that we're going to get, gather, but then we have to do something with it. We have a control system, the gutter and the downspout. The storage was a 55-gallon rain barrel. But the problem is, and now this was like 35 years ago, that I did, this was my first collection system. This was my first big mistake. And that is, you know, not understanding that that rain barrel will overflow in a heartbeat. You get one rain, boom, it's full. Well, then what? And what was happening is the water was constantly overflowing and my beautiful, you know, French intensive raised bed garden, okay, got infested by, uh, you know, term termites. And so what I say is water overflow and wood raised beds equals the termite spa. And one day I came out and I put my hand on the wood, which should have been painted wood, and it went crunch. And I went, ooh. And I found out that there was no wood, that the whole thing was just a piece of paint because the termites had eaten it all. So now you say, okay, how do you learn from this? Well, the first thing I learned is the storage isn't where I stop controlling it. I have to continuously control it through the entire cycle. So what we did was we said, okay, we're going to take away the rain barrel because that doesn't work there. But we're going to keep the same collection area. We're going to collect it all the way to the end. And then take a look here. I've circled a brown pipe. That pipe, instead of being a downspout, connects into a three-inch PVC pipe Inside that, that goes to the rain barrel far away from the house. And when this rain barrel is full, there's an overflow that goes onto the ground and into a rain garden. And even then, if there was like that three inch rain, uh, rain event, it would flow off of that into the back driveway into a, another system and then another system. So there's redundancy in the, in, the, in the systems. But this is the first lesson that's really hard to learn. Okay, well, it's easy when you screw up like this. <laughs> you know, the, the whole idea here is 
you can't have water willy nilly laying up against the, you know, the house. That's a key thing. All right. So let's talk about the projects. These are the things that I'm going to uh, review tonight. Uh, we're going to look at the garden use. Okay. That's two systems. One's the rain barrel, the other's the IBC totes. The other one is groundwater recharge. And that represents the bulk of the uh, of the systems that I have on site, lawns, stream, patio, rain chain, wells, geogrid, and in-ground cistern. And we're gonna take these just one at a time. And I'm looking at the time, I got a full half hour to go through all these in decent detail. So let's start. Here's the rain barrel, the new location. If you look in the upper right hand corner, the, the, uh, the, the picture there, okay, the collection is still that roof. Can you see the blue on the roof? Okay, we're still collecting. Okay, that brown pipe that I showed you in the last slide, we painted white. So the water comes through that pipe and then out to the picture on the left. And you can see that if you follow the blue line, it comes to the end of the trellis and down that vertical pipe. And currently, the valve right here in the middle of the picture, that valve is open. So if I didn't want to collect any rain, it would flush straight on through and into the rain garden. But if I want to collect water, then all I have to do is close that valve, okay? And then that water then flows up and into the rain barrel. And then of course, in order to use it, I, I have a spigot there and I've got myself, you know, the ability to, attach a garden hose or fill a, uh, a bucket or, you know, or a watering can or something, you know, like that. So that's the new iteration, you know, of that failed project. And for me, the nice thing about it is that, excuse me, I get to grow vines, you know, and pretty flowers and things like that on that trellis. Here's the trumpet vine in the summertime growing on that trellis. You would never know that there is a three inch PVC pipe going through that feeding the, you know, the rain barrel. And I didn't mention it, but on the last slide, it, it showed the construction of the pedestal here. It's made out of cinder blocks that is on top of tamped gravel. And that's because that barrel is going to weigh something in the neighborhood of 400 pounds. So you can't put it onto uneven ground. You have to put it on something that's pretty solid. But this is the, uh, you know, the rain barrel. And I've identified the parts here. I'm going to look at the, this picture in the upper right hand corner. So here's the two inch pipe that connects over. Okay, so that supplies it. And even when this is shut off, like it is in this picture here, okay, or when it is shut off, it'll only go into the barrel. But when that's open, like in the in the winter time, you will get a tiny bit of rainwater into the barrel, just because rainwater has a lot of surface tension. And it will turn the corner and get just a little bit into the rain. Uh, and so the picture down below, I'm reminding myself it's winter time. I have to have the spigot open in the winter time and, and drain that off. All right. So here we have the supply, and it's, it's hard to see, but here this is pointing to a one inch tube that joins up with the two inch flow down here into a PVC pipe that goes to the rain to the rain garden. And we're going to see the rain garden in a little bit. But there is an overflow to in order to deal with the rain barrel in case I don't throw the the uh, big valve open, you know, which I would normally do if the, if it's full. If I've forgotten that, it'll just go through the barrel and drain out and into the rain into the uh, the rain garden. So that's the first one. That's the rain barrel. Okay, let's look at the IBC totes. And let me just start out by saying, you know, IBC totes, it's very simple. It, it, it means intermediate bulk container. And it is the thing that is shipped all around the world that has 250 gallons of ketchup or 250 gallons of tomato sauce, which is what was in here, right? I, I bought two of these used and they had tomato sauce in it, and I had to wash them, soak them and wash them out a couple of times in order to get them clean. But these totes are designed to be food grade for shipping food. And so once you've cleaned them up, they're great for storing water. The only issue is that they're relatively translucent. 
So if you're going to put them out in the sun, like the picture on the bottom right, okay, you're going to have to paint them or wrap them in plastic or cover them in some way because the water, uh, you know, if it gets the sunlight, will start to grow algae over time. Of course, if you're constantly running the water through, the rainwater through and using it, it's not a problem. But there's big chunks of the summer where water will sit there. And so you, you don't want any algae growing. So you paint it or cover it in some way. Now, these totes here, like I said, there's two of them. They came inside of these wire cages, like you see in the back here. And that's because this is the, the cage that protects the, the actual tote, the actual tank from getting punctured as it's shipped around the world. It's made so that a forklift can pick it up and you can find them used online. They're all over the place. Uh, maybe it's harder now, but you used to be able to find them all over the place. And this drawing in the upper right hand corner was my original con concept of how the totes would be used. They'd put side by side, like in this picture uh, down on the right, and then I'd connect them, connect them and I'd have a spigot on one side, but there's also the drain. And we're gonna see that in a second, you know, going out. Now I flip the spigot from this side to the other side, so you won't see it. But let's let's go down the list. I've got the list on each one. The collection, the rear roof, the control. We have a gutter connecting, you know, to through the through a new trellis. We have two 250 gallon IBC totes, and the use we're using it for garden, for pets, and for birds. So this is the second item that I'm using not for groundwater recharge, but for actual use. Here's the finished, uh, the big photograph shows you the finished plumbing and everything. You now get to see the trellis. Here's the trellis while I was building it, right? We go boom, 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 done with posts. That turns the corner over there, picks up the, the rainwater from the back roof, which was the first, one of the first uh, photographs I showed you. And now it comes through and down, okay? And let me, let me, I'm gonna put a tone on here. I'm pretending the, the eclipse is happening. Here's the, here's the eclipse. And I'm doing that just so that I can give some arrows here for you to see. Okay, here's the water coming in from behind the shed and comes from the roof and then travels through the pipe that's in the trellis. Then it makes the change in angle from horizontal to vertical and you can see that there's a little flare here. That's a three inch flare that has a colander in it, or actually it's a wire screen, but I bought it from a dollar store, fits perfectly. And that's a like a pre-filter for the tank. If I don't want to use the tanks, the water drains down and out. If I do want to collect the water, I, I throw the, the valve and it goes into the tank and I put in a little, a tiny little uh, arrow back here. Behind here is where the spigot is, uh, both if I wanna use it for you know, like watering plants or if I need to drain the tanks. So that's the, that's the IBC tote, uh, you know, totally from start, you know, start, start to finish. And I'm gonna remind you at this time that I encourage you to either make notes or better yet, put your questions in the chat as we're going over the individual uh, systems so that you don't uh, forget it because not that we got seven more systems to look at. All righty, so let's let's move on. Oh, let me let me just go back and just say, eventually, oh, two things. One is the system isn't operational right now because I have to replumb the gutter in the back of the house. Right now, all the gutter goes to the patio drains or over to the right hand side and we're going to be replumbing the uh, the gutters to drain here and so that's first and then that'll connect it to the system and hopefully this summer we'll get you know up and up and running the second thing is even though i painted this with a, a gray paint i really you know this is just an aesthetic decision i i want this to look to blend in a little bit more for the yard and you can see the fence behind has lattice on it. So I'm just gonna wrap this with the same lattice that's on the fence. So it becomes more of a, 
you know, integral part of the of the backyard. So that's the uh, that's the IBC totes. All right, now here's where we begin talking about ground groundwater recharge, and I'm going to show you the simplest thing that any, anyone has if you have a yard, and that is the ability to collect water on the grass or some sort of porous surface. Not only do I have this yard in the back, but I have a yard in the, in the front, and I have a common area between two houses that's gravel. <clears throat> All of these allow water to just run directly into the ground. But here's an interesting thing about living in Philadelphia. The water department wants to charge, and I think this is totally reasonable, for impervious uh, you know, coverings on the ground, because that impervious uh, covering would normally lead to storm runoff. Well, the gravel on the right from a scan from a satellite looks like it's impervious. So that's relegated as impervious. But in reality, it's more pervious. It allows more rainwater to penetrate into the soil than does any of the, the, the uh, uh, lawn areas that I have, because the lawn areas are all slightly sloped. Okay, let's, let's go down the list. The collection is the lawn or gravel areas around the property. Okay, the control is that we try to get near level areas, okay, not totally flat. You don't want it to become a bog, right? But you wanna have near level areas that will, will allow the water to move slowly. And that's the picture that I'm showing you here on the left. The brown one where I'm regrading the backyard to be flatter. Okay, right now I still have this pile of wood. This is wood that's seasoning for, for a project. When, when that is uh, used in the project in the house, the area that's sitting on will also come down about five inches so that the backyard is relatively flat, still sloping a little bit, but relatively fat, flat. So the rainwater that falls there for the most part stays there. But remember I said that we've got redundancy in the yard. This yard drains to the back driveway. The back driveway drains to a whole nother system that I'm gonna to talk to you, actually two different systems that I'm gonna talk about in a little bit. So let's finish with the list. Storage is basically just the impoundment on the site, whatever that is, and the percolation rate into the soil. Now you can, going back to one of those earlier slides, I said the engineer or the groundwater hydrologist, hydrologist or the the landscape architect, they can do what's called a perk test of your soil or percolation test of the soil to identify how much rainwater can actually be absorbed into the, into the, uh, the soil over what period of time. So that's uh, when we talk about percolation into the, into the soil. And the use is simple as flood control because we're trying to impound the water, run, allow it to run off as slowly as possible. Okay, and then recharge the recharge the ground. So this is the simplest type of uh, stormwater management that you can have. All right, let's take a look at the next one. You'll recognize in the big picture, this is the, the uh, rain barrel. Here's the trellis coming off the roof. This is before the other trellis was put on, right, for the IBC totes. That one would be right there. And when I'm not collecting rain in the rain barrel, or if there's overflow, it goes to this, it's a man-made stream bed, and you can see three different pictures of it here. This one is dry, the left one is dry in the summertime. This is in the late fall during a heavy rain, and you can see that it's sloped slightly, but the end of the stream bed before it hits the driveway comes up in elevation slightly, so it will impound water and allow that to, to uh, run into the, uh, into the ground. So that, you know, that holds water, but eventually if there's enough rain and enough runoff uh, from, you know, from the roof, it will spill over and onto the back driveway. And like I said before, I have other redundancy in the driveway. And then the picture during the, the uh, winter time, one of the nice things about having uh, this new, this is a relatively new feature on my, my property, is that I get to have, you know, sort of a different microclimate. I get to have wetter plants. And I also have year-round interest 
with the large rocks because the gravel and the rocks absorb the sunlight. And of course, with that thermal mass, they hold the heat. And so the snow very rarely sticks in the stream bed, right? And, and, and so there's always some sort of interest uh, to it. So having those, uh, those rocks is a, is a great thing for me. All right, that is the, the rainwater stream. And of course, all of these projects that I'm talking about here can be scaled up or scaled down. You know, my property is not huge. <laughs> I've got enough room to do different projects here, but if I had a huge backyard, I could change this little, you know, rain garden stream into a very large signature feature on the property. All right. This is one of the first ones that I did uh, because the patio was installed, uh, you know, 32 years ago, 33 years ago. And we installed the system at that time right? It's underneath the patio. The first thing I want to point out with the patio is you see the, the fan shape or the, I like to call it the dragon scale shape. This is a very old shape. And if you do live in Chestnut Hill and you come down the hill to Mermaid Lane, they are relaying the Belgian granite sets in that intersection, Germantown Avenue and Mermaid Lane. And they're laying it in the traditional scale pattern. And that is nothing more than a practical solution to a problem. And that is, how do I lay stones very quickly? And so one person sitting, I'll point the arrow over here on the left. If I'm kneeling here and I've got nothing but sand in front of me or substrate in front of me, I'll place the first one, the first one, and then by the arc of my arm, I lay the second, the third, the fourth, the fifth, and I reach out until my arm can't reach anymore. And that's the last set that I'll put in. And the only thing that I've done here is I accentuated that last row with a contrasting color. In Chestnut Hill and in most, they just do it with all one color. And the thing about that is it's wonderful, but you don't see the underlying pattern. So what I've done here is I've created that scale pattern, you know, or that urn shape pattern, or that tulip pattern, however you want to see that. But let's talk about it as a groundwater recharge system. The collection, okay, is from the patio itself. The rain falls on the patio. And you see on the left-hand side, I've called out, there's the pavers, there's uh, four to 12 inch sand, and a plastic liner. And you can see the sand goes down a slope and then comes back up a slope. That's because underneath the sand on top of the plastic liner, okay, is a four inch French drain. That four inch French drain is covered, well, 33 years ago, there was no such thing as a geotextile geotext or a geofabric. There was, you know, there was no fabric that stopped uh, like ground or soil moving through it, but allowed water to go through it. So interestingly enough, fiberglass insulation does the exact same thing. So that four inch drain is wrapped in fiberglass insulation and then buried in the sand. Now, because the plastic liner is on a slope, it slopes down to the French drain, picks up the water, and runs it off to the left-hand side out to the orchard. And we're gonna see that in a little bit. But I just wanna say that weather is changing, okay? And I used to collect all the rainwater on here as well as the water off the back of the roof, okay, into this four inch French drain. But that four inch French drain can't handle all the water from the patio and the roof. That's why the IBC totes that's why we're changing the gutters in the back and rehanging them to go out through the trellis to the back driveway where the totes are. So understanding the limitations of your property and understanding how much rain you might get. It's like right now we've been okay, even though we've had some large events. The, the three inch rain event that we just had was over two days. So the patio could handle it. 
Okay. And, but if we had like, like New Orleans, like last year, there was a storm that came through, dumped 12 inches of, of rain in 24 hours. Okay. My house would be underwater. So that's why I'm switching the, you know, the gutters and everything. All right, back to the list on the right-hand side. We've got the four-inch subsurface sur collection and the storage is in the orchard. And I'm gonna show you that in a, in a minute here, not only underground in tanks, but also in basins above ground. And then the use, this waters the apple trees, okay? And it's also flood protection for the house. All right, so let's, now that you, you've seen that, let me say one thing about the drain. This is a picture here of a cloudburst. They gave us like an inch in a very short period of time. You can see that I've got, it's like an inch and a half of water sitting on that patio. It just can't percolate fast enough through the, through the, uh, the spaces between the, uh, uh, the pavers. Actually, I'm gonna go back a slide here and just say, when it comes to pervious and impervious you know, materials, it's really all about the spacing, right? So if I laid this in brick that was tight brick or pavers that was tight pavers, there it, it would be basically an impervious soil. Water would run off of it. But this style, okay, of paving has lots of gaps. And that's why I put this down, down here in the right-hand corner. You see how big the gaps are? That allows the rainwater to percolate through there's no doubt the pavers are impervious, but the spacing allows it to be pervious. But when we have a big downpour like this one, it's like the, it floods. And so I need a drain, right? Well, here's the drain underneath, okay, this uh, brass cauldron. But it's a really interesting drain. I mean, it's a four inch drain, but underneath the, the cauldron has a very specific purpose. Notice this blue ring here. You're gonna laugh. That blue ring is actually a ceiling fan cleaning tool. Normally it's a, a very shallow oval and you would slip it over the fan blades and go back and forth and clean the, and clean the dust off the fan blades. But it's absolutely perfect for being a filter so that this drain never clogs. But after a big storm has come through, I take the, uh, the, the cauldron away and that's what I had. I've got all the debris that washed down across the patio and I just remove the filter, blow it off or pick it up, sweep it up and then put the clean filter and the cauldron back on. So that's a, that's a, a, a really, really important part of this particular system. All right, so let's jump to the, the thing that's also on the patio and then we'll get over to the, the basin. I've got 10 more minutes and I think we're right at spot on time. All righty, so the rain chain is something that I really enjoy, okay? And you can imagine, you can hear the rain when it comes down through the chain, you can see the rain. This is actually showing the, the spritzing. The one thing you have to be careful about rain change, and that is most splash water all over the place. You just can't have, you know, a typical rain chain des a design unless you have really deep overhangs on your house. Otherwise the house will get wet. And the problem, the second problem with the rain chain is that people tend to just think it's a gutter and you just leave it, you know, like run onto the, onto the ground next to the house. That doesn't work either. You don't want water next to the foundation. So I created a basin. Here's the construction of the basement right here. It's just a concrete form. And then after that dried, I took the form off and then created like a tub on the bottom that's connected to a two inch drain that also travels underneath, in this case, the porch and out to the orchard. So what I'm doing is, again, the list. Okay, I've got portions of the rear roof, not all of it, okay, because I can't overwhelm or I don't wanna overwhelm the rain chain. Okay, the control is the gutter, only part of the water actually makes it to the rain chain. The rain chain itself, the concrete basin and a drain that takes water away from the house. Okay, then storage, and we're gonna talk about that in a second, and the use, we're gonna talk about that uh, in a second. But I have to draw your attention to the bottom right photograph because this is for me one of the beauties of having rain chains. 
And that is in the wintertime when it does get cold enough to freeze, you have this beautiful work of art, you know, courtesy of nature, you know, dripping water, freezing like a big icicle, you know, sitting there. Obviously, the rain chain has to be held to the fascia of the house very well. Right? <laughs> Otherwise, you have problems. All right, let's get on to the orchard. So I talked about two different systems, both the patio okay, and the rain chain draining out here. And you can see on the left-hand picture, there is standing water and the two blue tanks that are embedded in the ground. It's a basin where the trees are because, and I've drawn it with a dotted line, because it runs down from a wall, flat, and then up on the other side. So after the actual basins, and you can, you know, they're just tanks. I actually, well, let me finish the list here. Storage, two 55 gallon in-ground barrels, but the key here is the, the bottoms are open and there's gravel underneath it, right? And there's also filters on the top so that the rainwater coming in doesn't get any debris into the tank. And under, I don't know, uh, during, I don't know, maybe 80, 90% of the rains we get, we fill up the tanks and that's it. The water slowly percolates down through. But when we have a big gully washer, it fills the tanks up immediately and spills out into the basin. Now the basin itself can hold somewhere in the neighborhood of six, 700 gallons of water. So I've got a lot of protection before it then flows into the parking lot next door. Before I put those uh, barrels in, my apple trees, you see two of them there, my apple trees were dying because there's too much water sitting across the entire orchard for too long and it wasn't allowing oxygen to get to the roots. As soon as I put the barrels in, the trees have become a lot happier. All right, now we're protecting the apple trees and frequent flooding and groundwater recharge. All right, last couple things. This one is a bit obtuse, but I can tell you right now, when I found these in the dumpster, you have to understand, I love to salvage things. I love to reuse things. This is one of those things where I, I I passed this dumpster and I saw, you know, this pile of things that people, most people would not know what it is. And I went, holy heck, that's a geogrid. Okay. And they were doing a big renovation and there had been a geogrid in the grass <clears throat> around this old, uh, it was like a retirement home to allow the fire trucks to drive on the grass. These things are made as invisible paving. You see them in country clubs and golf courses and all, well, you don't see them because all you see is the grass, but you'll see it marked fire lane. And you know that underneath that are things like this, a geo grid that allows you to support a ton of weight. And I said, okay, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna take my back driveway here and I'm gonna replace the asphalt. And so here's the beginning of this project. Okay, and what we've done is We've ripped up the asphalt, laid down a layer of sand to get it flat, and now is in the middle of the wintertime. And I had access to some sod that a school was using, you know, that they had thrown out. So I put it in the grid. Right. So, and now we have grass growing there. And hopefully later in the year or maybe next year, I'll finish the project and go all the way up the driveway. All right. So, collection was the rear driveway. Okay. The control was how the driveway sloped and the asphalt edging. The storage, okay, it's slowed down through the pervious geogrid. In other words, I, I'm putting lawn between it and the, uh, and, and the parking lot and the use is groundwater recharge. All righty. Now here is the biggest project of all and I wanna just get right into it. I wanted to create off the back drive an in-ground cistern and in order to do that, okay, and for green water, for groundwater recharge, here's the driveway area we had to dig up and you can see we're chopping up the asphalt. It was not great asphalt. We didn't have to take a jackhammer to it. We just pounded the heck out of it and we pulled, uh, picked it up. Then we put in a brick edge and then dug out the soil. Here's the final ditch. Okay, now inside that ditch, I wanted to put something, okay, that was free, that would create a space for in this case, 600 gallons of water to be stored underground and recharge into the ground. So let's take a look at this. 
This collects water from about 80% of the backyard and the, the community garden next door. The control is the rear drive, uh, drive and, the, and the drain, and I'll show you the drain in a minute. 600 gallons of in-ground, and we're using it for groundwater recharge. All right, this is what it looked like okay, as we're assembling it. And the interesting thing is these are just found crates. These are found culverts, and these are found buckets, five-gallon buckets. And we repurposed them all to fill in this void, and we wrapped the whole thing with, I, I scavenged some, uh, this is uh, corrugated fiberglass, and put geotexic fabric all over it, and then buried, right? And along the way, what I did was I moved this fence over to the other side, okay, to get uh, a new bed, a garden bed on the other side. So this was phenomenal. And then all the, the soil was either put back in or moved to another, another project. Here it was after we moved the fence over and looking at the fence, everything that's white is repurposed lumber. Everything that is tan is brand new lumber. And this is just me saying, you know what? You don't have to buy everything brand new, right? You can redo things. And that arrow that I just pointed on the left-hand side, you know, over here, that's pointing to this drop inlet. This is a 1890s cast iron drop inlet. You see them all over Fairmont Park and down on the drives, okay? And that's what it looks like now today with the, this is a, a bug screening and a leaf holder right, so that the pit doesn't fill up. And because there's standing water down there from time to time, okay, we don't want mosquitoes to get down in there. So that's the project. Now, if I go one step further, this is like the next year, you can see here's the fence. And on the right-hand side, the, the picture on the right-hand side, okay, oops, here we go. Oh, it didn't, uh, there it is. The, the dash line on the right-hand side is where the in-ground cistern is. And now we have the, uh, the bed there. All right, we're coming right down on the end of the presentation here, but I've got a bonus slide for you. This is a project that I stuck in when we were doing the, uh, you know, that big 600 gallon, right after we finished the 600 gallon in-ground cistern, I said, and this is why people call me crazy all the time. You know, I said, you know what? Wouldn't it be nice if we could collect all the water from the clothes washing machine, okay? And, and allow it to percolate into the ground. So I conceived of three pits and you can see them on the left-hand side here, made out of crates because crates are phenomenal for creating space underground. The middle photograph here on the left, you can see how it's wrapped in geotextile fabric. We buried them underground. Here's, this is the third one. If we go back up where this fellow is, this is the second one. And the water will come in from the right-hand side and travel underground and fill each one uh, successively. So that's the, uh, that's the bonus slide. And I have to say that we have another bonus for you uh, right now. I'm just so happy. It's eight o'clock on the on the money. Okay, and that is, I've asked a friend of mine, Ross Pilling, to come and present slides for his garden. I I couldn't overlook this. Okay, Ross and I have known each other for a long time, uh, but we just recently reconnected. And when I went over to his house, I looked at his yard and I said, "Holy heck, Ross." We have to bring you in and allow you to uh, to explain how your bark backyard was transformed into uh, this wonderful oasis. So before Ross starts talking, okay, I just want to read something because, of course, I had to ask Ross uh, to sort of bring me up to speed on on what he's doing right now. So when he's not doing beautiful creations like this, let me read let me read this to you. Ross Pilling founded the Conservation Development Partnership in 1994 as a conservation-based real estate practice providing creative solutions in the area of tax and estate planning for real estate assets, structuring conservation easements, conservation sales and financing strategies, conducting 
site natural resource investigations by merging two goals, land protection and positive financial outcome. He has been successful in preserving critical environment, environmental areas with positive gains to property tax, uh, property owners and tax advantage transactions. So with that said, hello, Ross, are you there? More or less of me. <laughs> okay. Well, so please, I, I'm gonna, you know, let you start describing this beautiful garden to the folks that are that are that are online. The screen is yours. Just tell me when you want me to switch the uh, the image. I will do that. So the 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 follow up to Hap's, Hap's presentation is that do not be intimidated to do these projects. They 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 can be incredibly rewarding. Um, I will say to you that the National Association of Landscape Professionals bestowed this award onto the installers who helped me with this. And it, it is truly a backyard oasis. I'm a, I'm a block and a half west of Killian's on Highland. Uh, my, my yard is only 25 feet wide. It's granted 100 feet deep, but we've really created something special out of this. And the overall concept is we've collected the, uh, the downspouts from both my house and the adjacent property conducted it into a bioswale into this pond. And then have, if you'll go to the next slide, um, what we've done, my, my pencil sketch is at the bottom. I, I'm not a designer, I, I'm a hack at this. It just happens to be really fun and um, has been part of my consciousness for a long time. So if you see at the bottom left, this, this, the, the, um, the downspouts come to a swale. The swale comes to just above the rapids is an aeration and energy dissipation system it goes into the pond. The pond, there's a, a pump at the bottom of the pond that pumps under, you can barely see my chicken scratch where it says bog filter. So it's pumped from the bottom up to the surface in this bog filter so the, 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 the stormwater is treated and then returned to the pond. And then in stormwater events, you can see below the bog filter, it overflows into what turned out to be a two-stage infiltration system. And over the past two weeks, uh, these storms have filled both basins. And where you see the sort of the uh, basin two, just above that, there's also a French drain. Uh, in these incredible storms, no stormwater left the site. And you can see the aerial photograph of, of how the installers actually did a really great job of, of create the implementing the, the concept that I came up with into a reality. I'm happy if you go to the next slide. So here you see what was just lawn in, in spring of 2020. In October of 2020, we undertook to do this excavation. It's a 3,700 gallon water feature, which is my absolute pet and love. I was into it, in it today in, a, in, in hip waders, maintaining the place. But just above that is where the two infiltration basins are. And then beyond, you'll see Main Street. So again, th these systems work. They're beautiful. They, they create a, a, a refuge and a, um, a, a wonderful setting that you can have um, that in, in your best expectations, you might even win an award like my, my installers created for me. So I, I really enjoyed this. And it, it is my... My, my pet project and my love that I, I play with this and enjoy the heck out of it, as do everybody who comes and visits. I encourage you to do same. Ross, thank you so much for sharing this with the, with the folks. Uh, I just you know love this backyard and sitting with you on the, the patio there looking at the gurgling water, you know, it's like the, you know, the absolute best. So, let me uh, move on and pass this back to uh, uh, to I don't know is uh, Chrissy you're going to take this or who's going to uh, who's going to uh, Rob field will this? yeah Rob will field the cue great so this is the time that uh, we'll be taking uh, the 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 questions and it sounds like Chrissy's going to go and uh, and see what's uh, what's in the chat if anyone's put anything in the chat. Well, I've been following the chat. I just oh, want to say, yep. Hi. I'm here to, I've got a bunch of questions here. Uh, I would like to say I've seen uh, Ross's backyard 
and it's quite wonderful and, and the, the apparent size of it is so much larger than its actual size it's really great now hap i haven't uh and by the way uh ross goes back with hap and me uh you might say we're the three amigos of uh environmental design from back in the 1970s uh from the university of pennsylvania um in any event uh I have not seen uh, Hap's place um, in person, and which leads to a question I'll uh, pull rank and I ask the first one. And that is, have you been featured on an NPR program? I'm thinking of uh, Grand Design or, you know, uh, this old. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, like yeah, yeah. I mean, have you been, <laughs> been able to uh, share this with a large liberal audience? Uh, actually, over the years, we've had different TV folks out here. Uh, and uh, I know when I first had the rain barrel on the back, we had the folks uh, at one of the TV stations, you know, out here. And but uh, not uh, not the way that you were uh, just describing. Yeah, the the grand design of Germantown, right? <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm glad to hear that this is not the first presentation you made of this to the to the public. So we have some interesting um Technical questions. Here's a really technical question uh, regarding your pavers. Is uh, four and a, four to twelve inches of sand a stable enough base? Do your pavers shift? Well, you were looking at paving there that had been there for thirty three years, and there's only one area that has slightly depressed, and that used to be underneath the fire pit, and enough water collected under the fire pit that it settled a little bit. But no, that that's a uh, Definitely four inches is, is plenty if you've compacted and prepped the subsurface well, right? So uh, obviously the the more stone, gravel, sub base and sand you have, the better off you are. Uh, but uh, the the four inches at a at a minimum there uh, has worked really really well for us. And the same person uh, about the fan blade cleaner. Um, what might you suggest for a one and one by one foot by two foot drain at say a public train station. Uh, this person needs to create a sort of non-trip uh, filler that would stop a drain like that from clogging. Do you have any suggestions about that? Well, yeah. If you uh, if if you notice the grill on my on my grate, which is, you know, it sounds like it's like half the size of the 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 drain you're talking about. There's obviously a grill to it that is you know allows people to step on it, right? And what I've done on my is taking some, some uh, landscape fabric. I took the grate, flipped it upside down, and I wire tied the landscape fabric to the underneath side of it so that rain could come and go through it. But if there's leaves and dirt, it would stop, right? And so just whenever it looks dirty enough to bother, you know, you pull it out and you take it over to the, the, the bed, you flip it upside down, you shake it out and then you then, then you put it back into into place, but that should work pretty well for you, I, I would imagine. Now, this same person who doesn't identify his or herself begs me to tell you that the daffodils that you planted at the Chestnut Hill West Station are blooming and beautiful. And... Oh, I have to I have to go back. Uh, it's funny for one of my garden posts, uh, the, the for uh, the uh, Green Home Guru. Uh, I talked about the uh, daffodils. Now, Chestnut Hill, I just was a, a helper, you know, I was a uh, planting, but I've actually made it a mission of of salvaging daffodils. And this year, as of this year, my count is about a thousand daffodils that I've salvaged from yards uh, or places that are being torn up, thrown away, whatever, and planted them in different gardens around uh, the, the the city and a whole bunch of my yard you know, as well. So. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, thank you so much uh, for that shout out. You know, it's a it's a great. I'll have to come by and uh, and 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 see the daffodils. Uh, one last um, sort of semi technical question: Did you have to cut each of the squares for the geo grid? Oh, interesting question. Now, when when you put geo grid down, the normal way you would install it is you put your road base, whatever that is. Uh, and then a layer of sand or, or you know, some sort of paver material, just like you're doing a, a, a paver, like a patio out of pavers. Then you put the, uh, the geogrid down and you would then cover it in topsoil 
and seeded, right? And and so when as I move forward with the project, that's how the new ones will be installed. The, the picture you saw there of us dealing with tiny little squares, <laughs> that was just me being crazy. You know, it's like it was in the middle of the winter time that I couldn't use seed. I couldn't plant seed. So I said to myself, oh, wait a minute, there's this place over here that is throwing out a couple rolls of sod. It was actually a, a school that had just redone their a playing field. And so you can imagine they had huge rolls of sod and there was some left over that was in their you know, sort of trash pile. And so I picked up a couple of rolls, brought them home and you know, this, this is why people say I'm crazy, cut them up into little squares and then we put them into the geo grid. And I have to say that even though it was very laborious, uh, it was very satisfying. And we had green grass immediately in the middle of the winter time. So I, I'm glad you. I'm glad you. Uh, you caught on that one. Well, that's a good story. It's nice to see everything being repurposed in your world. Um, I, here's a good question: Do you have a basement? If yes, have you seen a difference in lack of water or moisture in the basement due to your water management systems? <laughs> oh, okay. So that's a sore. That's a sore subject because there is a, a, a downspout, and this is why maintenance is so important. There's a downspot on the front of my house that the bracket to it uh, came loose. And it came loose a number of years ago. And but it's sort of out of sight and out of mind. So I never, I never really paid too much attention to it. But that downspout didn't drain into the splash block. It sort of moved back and forth and it ended up eroding the soil underneath the splash block. And so during that three-inch storm we had. I had a flooded basement, oh, okay, because, and and I had no idea like where is this coming from, and so I went out and I did some you know sleuthing around, and I found this big hole uh, under underneath what where the downspout sh should have been going. <laughs> yeah, so uh, so I immediately like backfilled and and foamed some edges, and I, and luckily it it hasn't come in since, but we're watching very very closely, uh, but. Um, yeah, it uh, that that is definitely a sore subject for me, and a testament to how important maintenance is in uh, uh, in in, an, in a house, any house. Here's a, a question. I'm tempted to editorialize or add some adjectives, but the, I'll read it as it is. Is the goal to have 100% pervious uh, surfaces on the property, or is there any benefit to having impervious surfaces? Well, yeah, there's there, there's a real benefit to have impervious soils. You get to control the water, right? It's collect, control, right? And uh, it's, um, let's just, well, if I if I only had impervious surfaces, there's a whole bunch of stuff on the property I wouldn't enjoy, like the rain garden, mm -hmm. right? So, um, no, I, th I think that most people think about impervious as being bad, right? We, sh we shouldn't have impervious. No, what you need to do is use the impervious services as a way of collecting and controlling. Then use the pervious or porous surfaces to recharge with. Of course, if you're trying to store it in a rain barrel or an IBC tote or underground tank or something like that, it's all gonna be impervious because you're trying to store the water. But if you're trying to create a water feature or if you're trying to do groundwater recharge, at some point, you have to be porous. You have to let it let sit on the land. But there's lots of different ways of doing that. And I hope that tonight's presentation sort of showed you the, you know, the gamut of, of, uh, of options that you, you know, that you have. So, no, it, the, the, the goal is definitely, well, it's, it's impossible to have all porous uh, surfaces. You've got a roof over your house. You've got a driveway you, 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 you drive on, right? And well, okay, I can rip up the asphalt driveway and have gravel, but then I have to be really careful about the gravel because if I have small gravel, I can't put it on a slope. I can only put, you know, like gravel fines on a flat thing. And the steeper the gravel gets, the bigger the, the gravel has to be to avoid the erosion. So, you know, there's, you know, different questions, but I would always uh, love to have a combination because I'm looking to collect, control, 
and then do something with it. And like the tarp in the in the desert, yeah, and obviously. Yeah, exactly. And I tell you, when I saw that, I about fell out. You know, because you can get these recycled tarps online for almost free, uh, and uh, and they're huge. You know, I think his was like four, 20 by forty. Just think of a billboard, right? The size of that. And it, you know what he did was he went out to you know hit the, like the back forty and said, okay, here's a place that has just a slight dip in it, a slight swale. I'm going to fasten the tarp there and collect all this water down to one area, and then I'm going to filter it. I'm going to put it into a pipe, and I'm going to take it to a lower area where I can then put it in tanks. And that particular one he does for wildlife. What he does, he creates a watering system that allows, uh, you know, different wildlife from the desert to come up, you know, and get a drink of, of water. And he has one of these trail cameras down there and you get to see the bobcat in the middle of the night, you know, skulking around and drinking water. And, you know, it's just, it's, it's tremendous. I was about to say, we're running out of questions. I had two left, but I have a couple coming in. Um, one is not a question. Um, for those curious, Hap's blog at Green Home Guru is on Instagram, not any other social media sites. So that's a little plug for you. Um, Thank you. And Chrissy follows up with Instagram.com slash Green Home Guru, all underlined. Um, I uh, have a question here. Um is there a general estimate about the amount of water absorbed in a lawn versus a meadow's absorption rate? That's an interesting. Yeah. Yeah, that's one of those engineering uh, things that I showed at the, at the very be beginning. Uh, meadows, okay, and forests, but meadows in particular, tend to be more complex. They tend to have deeper root structures, you know, which means, you know, more air you know, and, and uh, a more open soil. So you're going to have a more porous soil. So yes, a a meadow, especially a meadow that has native species in it, you know, will uh, absorb uh, more water from the rain than a lawn. And you know, I'm a I'm a big proponent of lawns, but lawns, not turf. And there's a difference. You know, a turf lawn is the lawn that you use herbicides and pesticides. You know, and you mow and you really it's a very intensive thing my opinion about lawns that are turf lawns it should be at the golf course right it, everywhere else oh okay maybe in some small areas if you're really trying to keep up with the joneses and you need that small strip of absolutely pristine grass but you know the kids don't need it to play on it and the dogs don't need it to run on it and if you uh you know just allow a lawn to go you still mow it right but you don't do anything to it all these wonderful native species and even some invasive species will pop up and right now out the back like in the orchard area that i showed you it's got all kinds of weird plants out there that i'm not you know like star bethany I'm not, I'm not a big proponent of that but it also has you know maybe six or eight different native plants you know that are extremely small and they flower at different times during the year and the bees love it. So you can still have a lawn, right? Without having turf. And uh, and the lawn, the, the turf lawn is only gonna be able to absorb so much, okay? Because the, the, the roots are typically not that deep because you're constantly feeding it and treating it and everything like that. But uh, sort of a native let it go kind of lawn okay, is good, but clearly the meadow is, you know, wins the, When's the thing? And I, you know, I, you see the memes on on social media where it's either or. You know, it's like we're going to have ourselves the golf course lawn, or we're going to have ourselves weeds up to our ears, and it's not that way, right? I mean, there's lots of good design in between that allows you to to still have you know a a, a safe property, you know, that's not infested with things, right? But still be natural. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm glad you just said all that because I couldn't agree more. And I, I think we're going to explore that more in the conservancy uh, programming about this whole issue of, of uh, the perfectionistic American lawn and all the downsides to that. Um, 
Chrissy, tell me, would do we have time for one more question? I sense we might be running out of time. Hi, I think we definitely have time for one more question. Well, here's here's one that I would guess is from somebody with a larger property. Uh, the question is, is there a way to find out what Philadelphia Water Department considers pervious versus impervious mm -hmm. on one's property? And if so, can you get it changed if it's incorrect? Yes. So the answer is, if you go to the Water Department website, you can find your property on, on their database. And you can look at uh, what they consider pervious and impervious because they've shaded it for you. They, It's like you know, sort of a light pink or a lavender sort of shading. They have everything they believe is considered uh, impervious, like your roof and your sidewalks and things like that will have that tone on it. Everything that they consider you know, porous Okay, they have not shaded. So, you know, look up your, you know, your address. And yes, you can petition to, uh, you know, to change that. I know when they first came out with that map, uh, we did that petition here. There's still a service fee, you know, that they're going to charge you. Remember, they, they took the water bill and broke it into, you know, potable water that they're supplying you and stormwater management, you know, which is draining off your off your uh, your property is a really smart move. I think it's really important because think about all the the um, uh, the parking lots around the city that don't have water service, but they're adding gallons and gallons, hundreds of gallons, thousands of gallons of water into the storm sewer. So they had to divide that up. Smart move on their part. Uh, and even if you petition and get them down to some very small number, you'll still have a monthly fee. You know, but it's not uh, it's not onerous uh, the way it is if you had a parking. Lori asks if you could put uh, that link into the chat. For ah, uh, well, I can't write this section. I write this minute, but uh, uh, but maybe uh, maybe someone can uh, look look it up. But it's if you went just Google for you know Philadelphia Water Department um, map, you know you'd you'd probably get it. Mm -hmm. Actually, I uh, have a question from Chrissy, which is a really good one. Uh, maybe this would be our last question. And uh, she asks, given the potential disproportionate impact of charging for impervious water runoff in Philadelphia on low-income communities, are you aware of any readily available resources that can assist in deploying efficient stormwater management tactics? That's a really good question. And like you know, all the other social problems we have, you know, there's always a disproportionate issue having to do with low income uh, you know, folks. With that said, the water department has been very active all over the city you know, and will give you rain barrels and will give you, um, uh, uh, you know, allow you to design, but it's actually, I'm not familiar. Maybe someone on the line is familiar with the water department's policy for renters, you know, like landlords versus homeowners, but I'm pretty sure that they, they do their water sense program for landlords as well. So a little bit more research uh, on the water department website and uh, and I know you'd find that. Right, or, nice. you know, let me, uh, uh, Rob, I'll just bump to the, you know, to the, to the last slide uh, and say, there's my email address. Okay, if you wanna follow up with any of these questions, Okay, feel free to uh, drop me an email. And I put Chrissy's email address in there too, if you want to reach out about, uh, about the uh, conservancy, right? She's the one-stop shop of, of uh, public information for the, the conservancy. So there's our two uh, uh, email addresses. Feel free to, to email me if you have a, have a question. And um, go I on, Rob. For the, uh, for the map. And it's an easy one, I think, if I just dictate it, is stormwater.phila.gov, stormwater.phila.gov forward slash parcel viewer slash. So uh, I th that's pretty easy. Stormwaterphila.gov parcel viewer for uh, the map we were talking about. And I think great. I'm correct that we are essentially out of time. I think it was a, a great evening. I certainly have enjoyed it and learned an awful lot. And uh, uh, Lori or Chrissy, 
Anybody else want to say goodbye to everybody? Thank you so much. That was amazing. Really fascinating. I can't wait for um, to share this with my husband. I have so many ideas. <laughs> Um, and thanks also for that for that link. Um, that'll be something really fun to to pay attention to. This has been such a wonderful presentation. Um, you explained some things that I've heard many times so clearly and visually. I finally understand some things that um, uh, have been a little more difficult to to break through for some reason. So. I'm sure that others have responded in the same way and um, and that's a, a gift. Thank you so much. Thank you, Rob. That's My amazing. pleasure. It's Great. been a lot of fun. Thanks so much, Rob. You bet. Wonderful. All right, good night, everybody. Night. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Chrissy.